Okay, we are live on the internet. Uh, if anyone's watching, welcome to Ask a Lycanologist, the April 2014 edition. Um, I'm Kenichi, and I'm here with uh, Tom Carlberg, who's... What's the name of the town you're in, Tom? Arcata? Arcata, California. Up in Arcata. And, uh, yeah, this is Ask a Lycanologist. So what we do is we gather some lycanologists or some lycanologically interested people and talk about some contributions to the Ask a Lycanologist project on iNaturalist.org. I'm even wearing the t-shirt today. <laughs> um, and we are still trying to get two more people on board, so hopefully they will see some option to join and join us while we're doing this. But, Tom, you had some ones that you wanted to talk about, right? Um, yeah, there's several ones. Uh, one which is just I don't... I can't. There's a lot of information in the photo. I can't really tell quite what it is, though. Okay. Uh, I don't know. This would be number the very last one on the list is a good place to start. Uh, Six one nine one eight seven. And this is contributed by uh, uh, Fanatic, who is a pretty regular contributor to our naturalist. Yep. Okay. So Fanatics. That was the last one. Let's yeah. See. And that's yeah. a good place to start. And he found it growing on a rock. Um, it's a you know it's a mixed photograph with a lot of other lichens, but uh, from one of the images that he posted, it's pretty clear which lichen he's interested in. And I it's, I can almost tell something about it, but I can't quite. So I was hoping Shelley and maybe Sarah's expertise would come into play here. <laughs> <laughs> and they're not hooked up yet, so uh, maybe not no, they're place not. to start. Uh, what else do we have? Here? We've got. Uh... Oh, here's one. Copy. Oh, so you just threw that up on your screen? Yeah, I'm screen sharing that one, and I'll, I'll screen share the next one that you wanna. That oh, you okay. wanna sh well, that's right. We can do that. Um, I have that one up on my screen too. Am I screen sharing? Oh, you are. Let me. I'll switch to you. Oh, okay. This is also this is a very common lichen uh, in well, the Pacific Northwest. Uh, this now I lost your. Now I lost your screen share. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, let's see. Screen share. I've got your screen share. Yeah, I put mine back up. Variable rag light. Well, here, let me give you the uh, observation number. It's the 560665. Okay. It's in that list. Uh, it's, probably, okay. it's probably safer if you do the screen share. Sure. Uh, get back to my screen. This one? Yes, that's it. Okay, let me download that. This is a really, really common lichen in the Pacific Northwest. Um, in fact, it's uh, for the air quality analyses that take place through the U.S. Forest Service. Mm -hmm. um, this is the one they use for collecting tissue samples of because it's almost always available in really large quantities wherever they're doing their air study plots. Uh, this fellow found it in Placerville, and I can't quite tell from the photo if it is Platysmacia glauca or not. It looks like it. It could be. Um, it's kind of a reduced form of it, but you know, Placerville's pretty far from Oregon and Washington, uh -huh. which, is where, which is where this lichen really tends to thrive and abound in. Uh, and I just wanted to bring it up for a discussion and see what Are you thought. What would you normally be looking for in, uh, in, in that species? Well, I would be looking for a 
the lower surface that's a mixture of black, uh, black, brown, and or white, which this one has. You know, the lobe edges are whitish, and then further deeper into the underside of the lobes, um, it becomes brown and then black. And that's one of the great things about this photograph is that it shows the lower surface really well. Uh, I'd also be looking for Isidia and or Ceridia on the margins and in the middle of the lobes. Um, and this one has Ceridia on the margins. So, you know, again, bravo on the photo. It shows a lot of the stuff that you need. The, the only problem I have with this lichen is that uh, Plasmacia glauca usually rises up off the branch or the bark a lot. And this one's kind of laying a little bit low. Hmm. And it's also usually a lot bigger than, than he's showing it. Um, but I'm not really sure what else to call it. So I, I flagged it for iNaturalist, and I thought we would see what people uh, uh, thought about this one. <laughs> well, I'm hoping that we can get... Sarah and Shelly on, but it doesn't seem to be working quite the way I wanted it to. That's okay. I remember the time it didn't work for me. It's pretty frustrating. Yeah, Google Hangouts sort of, sometimes it seems to work and sometimes it doesn't work so hot. Uh, and I can't seem to get Sarah on chat either. I'm just texting with her. She's apparently watching. <laughs> See. Well, I hope they're not getting too frustrated. They should. They're probably going. No, no, look in the upper corner. <laughs> it's right there. It's so <laughs> obvious. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh <-huh. laughs> I shouldn't be so mean to them. They can't help it. <laughs> uh, let's see. I can't invite them that way. Can't apparently do Q and A. Ah, yeah, beautiful photo. I just switched back to your screen. Um, this is a really good photo, and and if you're photographing lichens, as I've gone over with uh, Kenichi, and as everyone has gone over, um, it's 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 essential to photograph the lower surface as well. It's not always needed, but if you're going to ask somebody for a lichen ID. Uh, it's often the lower surface that will give you the genus, if not the species. Hmm. Okay, well, that's a pretty cool one, and I'm still failing to get Sarah or Shelley on board, so okay. well, why don't we look at a different one? Move on, then. Um, what do we got? Something else from your list that you thought was interesting? Yeah, 271665. You got it. No, it's, a whole, it's a whole lot of lichens. I, so, know. Um, <laughs> I know. Let's see if I can figure out one pick to pick out of there. How about good. that first? Uh, he's got the primary photo, and then he's got two secondary ones. How about the first of the secondary ones? Yeah, sure. If that's not a contradiction. Just download that. And share. And even at that, he's got several species in there. Yeah, so what do you see going on here? Well, I was just, you know, the, I was going to comment on the, the yellowish stuff. Um, it's probably not a Xanthoria, which I think he... See, what does he say? I've at least learned so far that there's more than just shield like it on the bridge. <laughs> True. Mm -hmm. There's quite a few. In fact, I don't think I saw any shield like this, which is also the genus Parmelia. Um, some of the yellowish things are probably a Candelaria. And I, I know I steered you to the first of the secondary photos, but now I want to steer you to the second of those two. Uh, <laughs> It kind of looks like a, a, uh, a 
So the second seems like a zoom in on uh, on one of those, so I can probably zoom this in over there. Yeah, and it's one of the it's one of the lichens in that photo that have apothecia, and it's kind of interesting because the apothecia have a, a white lower surface with an orange cup. Um, surrounding it is an orange lichen, which probably is a xanthoria. I wouldn't be able to tell much more on that one without either having the lichen or a better photo in place. Um, but but the primary lichen in in that second secondary photo uh, is really it, it looks like a Telechistes, uh, one of the ones that don't have the cilia all over the place. But there's no there's no thallus that I can see. Do should should all Telechistes have a thallus? Yeah, they should have a fruticose thallus that stands up like a bushy, branchy bush uh, above the substrate, and this one's not doing that. Mm. So, you know, I I brought it up because it looked interesting, <laughs> and I was hoping for some discussion on this. <laughs> sure. Well, what, what about the ramelinas, or the those gray fruticose ones that I think are ramelina? Uh, in the main photo? Uh, yes. So there's some sort of at the bottom of the main photo and to the, on the right side. To the right of center? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think he's got that in his, um, uh, his first secondary photo. Mm -hmm. uh, I wish he had taken the photograph for that Ramelina. Uh, it looks like, it looks like canariensis though. If I had to go with like just a gestalt, mm -hmm. but I would want to be able to see the the lobes actually splitting open with the ceridia on the inside uh, to be really sure of that, because it could also be a sun distorted uh, something else. Wait, so growing in sun can distort some ramelinus? Well. Lichens often grow differently in the sun than they do in the shade. Usually it has more to do with color. Uh, sometimes it has to do with stunted growth. Uh, but I like Ramelina canariensis. So I wish I could see this one a little bit closer. There are, there are other photos on iNaturalist that have that one. Uh, let me see and Ramelina canariensis is the one with the, uh, the, the split thallus margins. Is that correct? You can get that on both canariensis and subleptocarpha. Um, okay. Canariensis is um, it's a it's subleptocarpha has long strap-like branches, and canariensis has a, a pul it's called a palmate branching pattern. There's a mm -hmm. pretty broad lobe originating from a single base, and the lobe splits into finger-like projections uh, eventually. Uh, so they're they're different. Now uh, let's see. Oh wow, there's like five. So let's see, five nine zero two four nine. Five nine zero two four nine. Yeah. Ah, this is one of yours. Yeah, there's two of mine and three of yours. Apparently, we're the only people who notice this taxon. <laughs> I only noticed it because you pointed it out to me. <laughs> oh, did I do the IDs on this? Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> well, no, but you're noticing it, and and that's you know, if you hadn't taken the picture, I wouldn't have made the comment. Let's see, let's share your shot here. There we go. Yeah, nice. That's better. Yeah, there we go. So you can see it's a pretty broad lobe. The, the base of this lichen is to the, the lower right, and mm -hmm. the lobe tips are the, the thinner branches to the upper left. And you can see how broad the lobe is at the lower right. It's um, well, you can gauge by my finger. And then right above my uh, 
fingertip is where the lobe is splitting apart and all that granular stuff in the middle is uh, ceridia. Those are the, uh, the reproductive propagules uh, which combine both the algae and the fungus. You know, iNaturalist is pretty cool. Um, uh, it's really, really hard to go to species on lichens. Yeah, for sure. I'm, I'm noticing, and, and I see a lot of my, well, it's not my job, but my interest in it is is in, I call it putting on the brakes, because uh, people get really excited about lichens, and, and they they don't have the background for it, mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's often very hard to tell from the photos uh, much of anything about, about the, the observation that they've made, and I don't want to discourage them by any means. Um, but, you know, the closer they get with their photos, the, the better their chances are going to be. Sure. I often sort of, like, just add more conservative IDs to things, and I'm just like, uh, <laughs> you can't really tell it's going to be that unless you see these other things, so. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm sure it's in Ramalina, but I, I don't see enough to see, you know, how you, you get know, to species. And, and the good news is that you often can get to the genus um, from a photograph, as, as long as it's not a crustose species. Right. Um, there were some that I wanted to look at. Well, there's one of mine that I wanted to look at, but I'll kind of have to do that. <laughs> um, as long as we've been talking about Ramalina, could we do one more from my list before that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we're only 20 minutes in. Uh, that very first one, 517302. You got it. In the chat window. Yep. Let me just load that up. Yeah, let me get there, too. So there go. Um. Download this. And this is actually one of the ones from, it's from the Midwest, from Ohio. Oh, this was observed in Ohio? Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's nice. called Ramalina Intermedia. It's a, uh, it go. looks a lot like, uh, I believe it's Ramalina rosleri which is a Pacific Northwest species that grows on bark. Um, this one is different, and it grows on primarily on rock. But this huh. guy found it on, uh, on sandstone. And I think he has the right ID. Uh, I'm not familiar enough with this species to, uh, to do the ID from there. Yeah, there's the photo. I don't want to do an ID from a photo from Ohio. <laughs> but I think he's right. Um, and since we were talking about Ramalina, I thought I would just throw this one in there and, and see what what people had to say about it. What do you? So, what would you want to see to to try and get this to Intermedia? Uh, well, I'd want to have the specimen in my hand. Uh, it's not a matter of the chemical test in this case. I just want to be able to look at it better. Mm -hmm. But his his photo shows a you know it's a fruticus like and the branches are not very wide. Um, they're covered with little, almost pustules of ceridia, uh, and and that's what I, that's what I think of when I think of ramalina, uh, ramalina intermedia, plus growing on rock, um, which in this case it's not. It's on uh, it's on a branch laying on the ground. But that, that's a pretty good uh, ID and observation. Um, yeah, it'd be kind of nice to get some more uh, lichens from other parts of the country rather than uh, just the West Coast. We have a couple. Yeah, yeah I do look at lichens from, from other areas, and I, I enjoy the diversity, the exciting stuff that people come up with. Um, <laughs> but I'm often stymied because I'm not that familiar with right. the Gulf Coast lichens or the Maine lichens or stuff like that. Are there any, like, lichen hotspots in the U.S.? In terms of diversity? Well, sure. Absolutely. What would they be? <laughs> <laughs> it's like asking a morel hunter to share his morel. Exactly. 
<laughs> there are morels in the woods. <laughs> what? Oh, yeah, go to the New Jersey dump. You'll really have a good time. <laughs> um, well, it's... I'm trying to just... Generically, you should look for places with high substrate diversity and, you know, I'd like to say high moisture content, but then there's places that are quite dry that also have really good lichen flora. Um, I know that in the Northwest, there's been a study done that analyzed um, lichen diversity. Uh, what was it? They start. They took a major watershed and they divided it into sub watersheds. Um, what are they called? Their class or level one, two, three, four, five and they investigated lichen diversity at each of the different levels of this watershed. And basically, and under those conditions, the, the lowest elevation combined with the highest substrate diversity, especially hardwood and conifers being present, provided the greatest lichen diversity. Hmm. Uh, so basically, you know, where your streams are starting, way the heck up in the mountains, that's not where you get the higher diversity. It's where the stream broadens out and before it um, before it enters whatever valley it runs through is a better place to look for lichens. Are there any sort of like regions of at least North America where diversity is higher? You know, like the California Floristic Province is ridiculously diverse for flowering plants, but are there like analogous regions for lichens? Well, if if there were as many lichenologists as there were flowering plant botanists, I'd be able to answer <laughs> that question. Um, so I don't know. Huh. Uh, you know, the the deserts have not been explored. The, a lot of even where I live, a lot of stuff has not been explored. There's it's the ratio is probably a thousand to one, and it's because plants are are pretty, and they're edible, and they're medicinally useful. So people have studied them, um, you know, not for the sake of studying them, but because they've used them. And people haven't done that for like They're not as useful to people, so they have not gotten nearly the attention. So you wanted to look at one of yours. Uh, yeah, let me load that up. So this is one that was, uh, oops. Observed by an INET user named Icosahedron, um, and do you have I think it was in it was in Sonoma County. Yeah, hold on a sec. I'll I'll paste it in once oh, I okay. share it. Start the screen share, um, and I then uh, name. yeah, this is the URL. I'm pasting that in the group chat. Um, yeah, so he saw this on Mount Diablo. Oh, not not in Sonoma. This is in my backyard. Um, and yeah, this caught my eye because I, I hike up on Mount Diablo all the time, and I've never seen a lichen quite like this. Uh, I've, I've been on that trail many times, too. Um, it may just be green because it's wet, and I normally see it under drier conditions. But uh, do you have any opinions on this one? I, I sort of don't know. So we're, uh, so we're East Bay? Yep. Oh, OK. Got it. So extreme East Bay. Um, let me get out the big photograph, and that is quite that's quite a color, for sure. Yeah. And it's probably a uh, a Fisconia because they tend to change color a lot. Really? Yeah, they do. They huh. you know all, all that pruinose upper surface that makes them so white. Uh huh. Uh, that just vanishes when they're soaking wet. Oh wow. Uh. I don't know if he made a note about what the substrate was. It sort of looks like bark. Yeah, there's, it does look like bark for sure. There's no comments at all right. uh, from icosahedron. Um, so we want to look for two things. We want to look for squaros risings, which I don't think we're going to get. No, not in this picture. Well, sometimes they project out from the edge. And there's a little bit of rising showing at the upper upper right. The other thing to look for, since this has apothecia, it looks like there's lobules on the apothecia when you when you go in for the uh, uh, 
original size on the image. Uh huh. There's not a lot of them, but you can see on the upper leftmost apothecium, there's right. a finger sticking up to the northwest. Yep. So, um, if this is a Fisconia, it's Fisconia americana. It's the only, I'm pretty sure it's the only fertile one that we have, even in this in the Central Bay Area. Hmm. Um, do we actually know that this one is wet? Because I noticed Icosahedron didn't respond to your comment. No, he didn't. Um, this was late March. It may have been after one of the big rainstorms that, that swept through here after more than a year of no rain at all. Um, yeah. I, I was so, guessing that also, and, uh, oh, you know, actually, the fact that the, you see on the, the right side where the margin is kind of blackish, uh huh. Those might be rising, sticking out from the lower surface. Oh, I see. And and you know the risings in this lichen, they tend not to be very individual. <laughs> they kind of form a mat. Right. So that could be what's going on there. So again, as you were talking about before, it's really good to get a shot at the lower surface of the lichen. In this case, if you can get a shot with a macro lens or even like holding your phone up to a a hand lens. Um, you can actually get a whole lot of detail. But to see those square ri risings, I remember you showed me that one time, Tom, and you really have to look very, very close. <laughs> it's pretty fine detail, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, anybody who's looking at lichens in addition to a, a phone or a camera with a really good uh, macro system, it helps to have like a 14 power hand lens or something like that. Right. Um, let's see if I can find the one that, that of mine that I want to look at. I saw this. It was a. I mean, it's I'm pretty sure it's Usnia, and it was down in Big Basin. But it had apothecia, which was a bit weird. Um, and it wasn't like the Arizonica slash whatever the other one with the really big apothecia is. Oh, huh. Yeah. Let's see if I can find it. Yeah, Arizonica. I think in the older keys is the name. Um, I think it's intermediate now. Although I keep looking for quasi rigida, which is supposed to be in California, but I haven't seen it yet. Let's see here. Okay, I'll paste in the URL here. And download this image. Okay, I'm going to uh, I'm going to go get a book, so I'll be right back. Okay. So for anyone who may or may not be watching, this was in uh, in Big Basin, um, and yeah, I was intrigued by the fact that it had these little apothecia. These were only like a few millimeters wide. Sorry for the time out. I wanted to see what the lichens of the Pacific Northwest had to say, but they don't deal with individual species descriptions. I was noticing in your primary photo 
Whoa, I think we got Sarah. Yay! How, oh, hey, wow. It <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, it's 8 o'clock. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's only 7.30. Hi, guys. Hi. Hey, Tom. Hey, Kenichi. Hey, what's up? Hang on. Can I stop my screen share here? Everyone say hello to Sarah and Shelly in the corner. <laughs> All right. Cool. I get to eat dinner now. <laughs> you guys, you guys have a camera. Okay, you have to move really, really slowly, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Oh no, do you have like more jealousy inducing food? <laughs> yeah, it's getting warmed up. Hopefully it doesn't take <laughs> off the end. <internet. laughs> Alright, so I'll go back to my weird Osnia here and see if you guys have any opinions on it. Oh, where'd it go? Go back to my screen. So yeah, this was in, in Big Basin and it was sort of like hanging from from trees, sort of a lot like uh, uh, Longissima, as far as I know. But uh -oh. it had these weird little apothecia. I don't know if that sort of looks familiar to any of you guys. Well, you know, the thing, theoretically, if it's in California and it's fertile, it's Vesnia intermedia, which is probably an old name for uh, Arizona. Does it ever have tiny little apothecia like this? Like I've seen that that Osnia with create with apothecia before, but they're you know they're they're like dime sized or or only a little smaller than that. They're quite large. It says three to ten millimeters, so ten millimeters is pretty good for a dime. Yeah. Um, and three millimeters is like maybe a BB. Yep. I mean these are. Two to three millimeters, pretty small. Okay. But it was sort—it was sort of consistent. I mean, I don't know. I've just never seen an Osnia like that before. So you're saying the only thing in the keys would be intermedia? If if you're going with the keys, yeah. I'm looking at one of your other photographs, the the first of the secondary ones. Looks mm -hmm. totally bizarre. Yeah, I don't know what was going on there either. I'm pretty sure it was the same, the same lichen, and it was quite wet. Yeah, and like the apothecia are kind of russet colored. Yeah, that's weird. Because <laughs> I've seen, you know, intermedia slash Arizona. I've seen that wet, and the apothecia don't change color that much. No. So I'm thinking for that one, there's probably a fungus infecting that lichen. Oh, okay. That's interesting and weird. <laughs> you can send that to Kerry Newson. He likes that stuff. Hmm. Oh, of course, you have a photograph instead of a collection. Right. But it could be relocated. This was in Big Basin. I don't know how they feel about nabbing pieces of lichen, but... So it's a state park? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's a no-no. Uh, they do have a new longissima in Big Basin, though. Hmm. So, but that's never fertile, is that correct? Uh, it there's like two collections in the United States that have apothecia, but that's it. Hmm. So no, the answer is no. <laughs> basically. Gotcha. Interesting. Well, thanks for looking at it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would go with this near intermedia. Okay, cool. Um, Shelly and Sarah, are you guys still there? Uh oh, I don't see them. They're connected, but I think they may have uh, turned off the video. Yeah, we're we're still here. Our connection was a little bit slow, and so we turned off the video. But um, yeah, I was just looking in the Sonoran Key to see if there were any other species. It leaves me a list that have apothecia. So I was still just scanning through that just to see if there were any other options. Yeah, the location of, well, Big Basin is a redwood forest, but, um, you know, that, that 
East Bay uh, Fisconia that we were looking at a minute ago would be Chetna, Sonora, and Keon also. In fact, I'm going to go grab that one, so excuse me for a moment. Sure. Sarah and Shelley, do you guys find that that Sonoran key is, is, is still useful for this area? Yeah, surprisingly, it, it's pretty darn good. It can. It, there's so many things that are in it. Um, and if I'm going to key out a crust species, that's pretty mm -hmm. much what I use. And um, yeah, it's a really great reference for most of the macro lichens that I find in the Bay Area, too. Interesting. And that we just share the same lichen flora with the southwest and the Sonoran Desert? Yeah, it's amazing. Huh. I mean, there's a lot. I think there's a lot in the Keys that you won't find in the Bay Area. But yet, <laughs> you know, so many of the collections that I make in the Bay Area uh, key out in these Keys. And this key is, um, it's. I think it's one of the newer ones that's out there. And so... It seems to be more up to date, and it's really, it's really um, got a lot of detail. I mean, you kind of have to be like a, a big tech type person to get through some of the descriptions, but um, but yeah, it's really useful. You do you know whether it's that um, it are present in the Sonoran? Desert region, but they're present in much lower abundances than we might have them here. So they still show up in their keys a lot of the time, but they obviously don't have the same like in Florida. That would be my guess is that the species may, there may be a lot of overlap in the species, but the abundances are quite different between the two areas. Does, does the Sonoran Key cover sort of like all the montane regions of Arizona and New Mexico as well? I think so. Yeah, the, I know that it says um, uh, it says if things are at higher elevations. So, yeah, I kind of think so. Maybe that also goes a ways towards explaining it, just because like there's such a you know variation in habitat between high elevation Arizona, say, and sort of like the the playas. There is a lot of variation in Arizona. Um, probably the the best. And this is a testimonial rather than a scientific thing, but uh, Judy Robertson used the Sonoran Keys extensively, and she said that it works really well for uh, Central California. She did not spend much time over in the Central Valley and the Sierra foothills, but she did some of that. Huh, interesting. Well, did you guys have another one that you wanted to talk about, or did you... Want to keep talking about one of these? Sorry, clicking. <laughs> well, I was I was going back to that Fisconia that we were looking at from oh, sure. uh, yeah. the Concord area. Apparently, there are three possible fertile uh, Fisconias in California. And it depends on if they color of the lower surface after you've scraped the risings off of there. So the color after you scraped the risings off, what would you be looking for exactly? Yeah. Color? What color are we looking for? Red? Is it red? <laughs> Probably not. Well, for <laughs> this photo we can't tell, for... unfortunately. <laughs> you There's no way to. Pale versus that. dark brown or black. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. That's not something I've I've looked for in Fisconia before. Yeah. So if you get it, if you get the lichen that looks like this, and the lower surface is dark brown to black. That would be the Fisconia americana that we talked about. And then if it's pale, then you're down to two other choices. Do we know if this has ceridia or isidia on, this, on the upper surface? 
Well, the photograph's pretty good. It didn't look like it. Oh, it looked like there was no ceridia or isidia? Correct. Why Nothing visible in this photo. Where are you going, going, going with that? Well, I think it does go to Americana then. Um, I guess just in notes I had taken and keying out some Fisconias that I've, I made the comment that Fisconia Americana is the only non ceridiate isidiate Fisconia on, on bark. And that the aplopecia are common with a lobe margin. Apparently, it could be Fisconia californica if the lower surface were pale. Hmm. That's the second half of the couplet that takes you to Americana, and then it asks you about the lower surface. I wouldn't hesitate to call it Americana, um, but I'm not really sure why. Can we look up whether Californica has Isidia or Doradia? Which, which key were you looking in, Tom? Sonora. Okay. Certainly Americana is a lot more common than Californica. Unfortunately, we're not going to get too much further on this one without uh, the color of the lower surface. Is Californica, uh, does it have apothecia? It, yeah, the way they key it out, um, they say often with apothecia versus apothecia present or absent. So you could actually go either way in the key since there are apothecia there. But I know most of the other ones, and they rarely have apothecia. And this looks like it's pretty uh, abundantly fertile. Right. There aren't too many pictures of Californica online, but the ones that are there, including Stephen Sharnoff's photo, don't seem to feature like abundant, obvious apothecia. Uh -huh. Would you There's throw one? the uh, URL for that up? Yeah. So here's the Sharnoff one. And then... Uh, Thank you. Oh, yeah. Here's one by Jason Hollinger, who's another really good lichen photographer. Yeah, I've met Jason. He was big on Mushroom Observer, too. Yeah, he uses Mushroom Observer a lot. He also uses Slicker a lot. Still haven't recruited anti-naturalist, but maybe someday. <laughs> oh, there's Californica. Yeah, so I don't know. Both those pictures sort of look. Oh, bit... oh, okay. I have seen Californica um, in Nevada. It's a much broader lobe thing. Jason's picture actually does have and have. Let me see if I, I'll screen share this. So I'm not just talking about things that are off off screen. Yeah, um, if you look towards the, the margins of the phalli in this photo, they are they're quite broad. Yeah. And there is there are some scattered apothecia, but they're small and they don't seem to have those lobes. I haven't spotted any yet. But oh, there <laughs> we go. Yeah, good point. Okay, I guess we're going to go with um, Americana on this one. Cool, that's interesting, and that's cool that it's in on Diablo. I'll have to keep an eye out for it the next time I'm up there. It's actually dirt common. Uh, I I see Fisconia a lot, but I don't see it with those apothecia that, that often, and I certainly don't see it green. Can you actually turn it green by just spraying it with a water bottle or anything? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Arming myself with a spray bottle next time. <laughs> well, the trouble is I think they all turn green. <laughs> right, not as a diagnostic, sim simply as a form of getting a different kind of photo. <laughs> oh, no, it's, it's very sexy. <laughs> cool. So do you guys have any others that you wanted to look at in particular? Um, I would like to go back to that first one that I posted on the chat window. 
Uh, not the first one, the last one. 619187. Sure, let's go back to that one. Because I did want to get um, other people's opinions on that to see if they could come up with something. Download this one. So, Shelly, I'm going to paste in the URL for that. Shelly and Sarah. And... Are you going to screen share it, or should we go to that URL? I'll screen share it as well. There we go. Yep, that's the one. So, just as a reminder, this was um, in Arizona, looks like. Right near the Mexican border, near Nogales. Is it on rock? That's what it looks like to me. Yeah, the secondary photograph that's there shows it clearly on rock. Right. I guess first first look, it kind of looks like a xanthoparmelia. That's my okay. thought. We should look at the other photo. Oh, we're, we have to check out the other photo now. Hang on. And the other photo is actually less instructive, but it does show the substrate. Are those acidia at the bottom part of the image, the sort of dark area? Uh, towards the right or the left? The left. Uh, that might be the rock showing through, unless I'm um, not looking at what you're looking at. Oops. Can you put your cursor on the screen share? Let's see. It's right here. I can see my cursor. I'm not sure if you can. I can, not too. It's a little cross instead of an arrow. Yeah. I, I think that's the rock. Because if you look at the, wow. the, uh, the other photo, let me download the other photo. <coughs> yeah, we weren't able to. I think our connection is slow, so we weren't able to go to that other link. So this is the other photo, and it is a bit blurrier. Oh, but that's good. I mean, it's nice. It gives you more of a habit for it, and yeah. it looks like a xanthoparmelia. See, see what I'm talking about, Tom, this stuff down here? Oh, yeah, look at that. That looks like a cydia or something. Mm -hmm. Well, there are two species of xanthoparmelia that have a cydia, in California, anyway. Oh, there's, isn't it Mexico? Wait, which one's Mexicana? This one's in Arizona, though. Well, the two are Mexicana and Plitii, and it's a chemical test to distinguish between those two. Good. This is why I wanted to uh, check with other people on this. The thing that threw me on this is that the lobes look kind of puffy. Yeah, I think they're just kind of, you know, kind of growing up a little bit off the rock and looking more kind of convex. But, but yeah, I think it, I think it looks like a xanthoparmelia and that part that Kenichi saw. It's, they do kind of look. I can imagine them being isidia, um, more so than ceridia because of just that darker color. Um, it seems like the isidia have a darker color because they have more cortex on them than ceridia. Does Anthoparmelia have any kind of like rock preference or just any rock? Substrate and ecology on on acidic rocks, often on soil near the coast. I'm reading for Xanthoparmelia mexicana. Uh huh. Um, in open arid habitat. Acidic rocks is what huh. mexicana is listed as. This stuff looks almost volcanic or something. But maybe I'm just thinking that because it's red. <laughs> that's, what, that's what kind of geologist I am. If it's red, it clearly came from a volcano. <laughs> no, it kind of looks like it was 
it was also skewed and forth and is not very organized or something. Uh-huh. Thanks. That sounds <laughs> no, way more scientific. I, yeah. <laughs> so I, I definitely thought volcanic, too, when I saw it. But, again, not not a scientific, uh, not, not a geologist speaking. Right. <laughs> Well, that's cool. So we think this is Xanthoparmelia and possibly Xanthoparmelia mexicana. Is that right? Or or Plidii. There's there's two that that have Isidia, and like Tom said, you really can't tell them apart unless you do a chem test. Gotcha. Which chem test? Out of out of curiosity. Uh, I think it's the K test that distinguishes, but I would have to check. Mm -hmm. Oh, already. Were there others on your list, Tom, that we didn't that we didn't get to, or that we skipped over because it was just? Oh, let's see. <laughs> I'm not sure why I put that second one on the list. We could go back to Platysmexia glauca, but let me check this thing first. Yeah, I don't know why I included that one. Oh, well, okay, sure, let's take a look at this one. It's, um, it's the second one on the chat window, 476969, Purchasaria postulata. Sure. I mean, we're never going to get the species on this one, but I was curious to see what other people thought about the genus. Weird photo. Sorry? The photo is, I don't know, it's just a weird-looking, well, weird-looking lichen to me. It's a weird-looking lichen to me, too. Um, it, it could be a purchase area. Um, or it could be, God only knows. We'll do this screen share here. But it was, you know, the photo's good enough, and the, uh, the ID is interesting enough that I thought I would throw it in to ask a lichenologist and see what the discussion shaped up as. So this one was observed by Thoth uh, in Sonoma County. Um, he says it's growing on an oak branch. And he's even got a spore shot. Yeah, two per ask yeah. mm -hmm. And the spores looked good for purchase area. They're not blue like that one that Shelley found up in uh, uh, the Siskiyou Field Institute. But they've got that double wall that purchase area has. So double wall, this this area over here. <clears throat> uh, let me get back to where you are. So what we're looking at in the in the um, the spore shot is is what a single spore or what's the structure we're looking at here? I'm pretty sure what we're looking at is um, there's a long ellipsoid filled with just granular stuff. And then surrounding it is another very thick-walled Oh, that might be the ascus. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, Tom. Okay. Yeah. So, okay, so we've got... Because sometimes these purchase areas have really interesting spore structures and ornamentations. Okay, so what we're looking at is uh, an inner ellipsoid that's slightly bulgier on the bottom. And it's filled with what looks like granular stuff, and it has a really thick wall that's darker. Can I share my screen and use my pointer on this? Yeah, go for it. Uh, I don't want to share my screen while I'm sharing your screen. Uh, if you just share screen and choose the, the window that you want to share, I think that'll work. Yeah, let me figure out which photo I want to use first, not the biggest image. Okay, so there we go. So let's see, share screen. I imagine this poor like it. So can you see that spore shot now? Uh, I can see it, and I'm sharing your screen. OK. Uh, can you see my pointer towards the lower left a bit? Yep. Great. So from here to here, is the spore wall. 
and that's really thick in purchase area spores. And then this this outer wall is uh, that's the ascus, which is the spore producing structure. Hmm. And it's also pretty thick walled in this case. I don't actually know if that's characteristic or not. Uh, but the, the large spore size and the thick wall tend to make me think that he's got the genus correct in this in this observation. Cool. So out of curiosity, like how do you prep a, a slide like this? Clearly you need a, a light microscope to get something at this scale, but do you scrape off a particular part of the lichen to, to get the spores? Um, I'm still screen sharing, so yeah, um, in, in this case you would you could dig out a little bit of tissue from these black, uh, <laughs> these black blobs. <laughs> Whatever they are. <laughs> well, they're 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 a distinctive form of apothecium, is what they are. Okay. Um, and and they, the black blob contains um, assai, or ascuses, and the assai contains spores. So you would just scrape that out, you would smear it on a slide, you would add some water, you would put a cover slip on top of it, and then you take the, uh, the acceptable tool as a pencil eraser on the end of a pencil, mm -hmm. tap the cover slip until it spreads out nicely, and then you look at it under the compound scope. Good to know. I know, so... the squash mound is the easiest thing in the world to do. <laughs> and once you get over that intimidation factor of working with a compound microscope. Yeah, and after you, of course, purchase the compound microscope. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's lots of, that for me is the limiting factor. <laughs> you can get away really cheap with something that will show you the spores that are that big. Mm -hmm. Can you get, get away really cheap with a camera attachment? No. Well, yes, because you're point and shoot. You can hold it up to the eyepiece and take a picture. Oh, okay. Have you tried it with a cell phone? Uh, not with the microscopes yet, but I, I, uh, I probably will since I'm in love with my smartphone, which no longer makes me feel stupid. <laughs> I, I recently tried using my phone, my iPhone, to do a picture just in a... Uh, in a dissecting scope, and it was difficult but possible. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think you can get mounts to put a phone up to the eyepiece. Sorry, Tom, but you, I think you can buy things where you can attach a phone to a microscope eyepiece. Yeah, um, I think that, that would really help. I know um, with various different cameras. I know Shelley's done a lot of um, testing different cameras and different contraptions to. Basically, to just line up the, the shot, because that's the hardest part. You can see, you know, in your in your photo, you can see the circle of the microscope view, but it moves around so quickly <laughs> that you can't take the picture at the moment when the circle is lined up. Right. So, just a, something to stabilize it in in line is what you need. Sure. You're talking about the point and shoot, or the or the phone camera. Um, either one, but uh, easier with a point and shoot. You know, you can kind of rig something up with a toilet paper tube or a piece of PVC. I think. Well, what what seems to help the most with the point and shoot is getting. Some of them have a really big, a large looking lens, um, and those do not work very well. But if you get one of the ones that has a uh, the lens that looks small. And I don't know if this is even the right word to be using. Do these things have lenses? I guess they must. But um, like mine, I can I can place the the bezel of the lens right up against the eyepiece and hold it there. So there's not any jerking around at all. But if you have to hold the camera away from the eyepiece, then yeah, stability becomes a real problem. And that's kind of the problem I see that you could run into with the uh, camera phone phone camera. Yeah, that, that was my problem, was that I couldn't set the camera directly on the eyepiece because it, it needed some distance. So. Yeah, so my point and shoot still has value in that regard. <laughs> but I have to tell you, though, if we're taking pictures out in the field, I like my camera better than my uh, point and shoot. 
I think yes. Kelly found a, a possible a photograph, at least, that looks really similar um, for this this species. We're looking at. Well, yeah, you know, Perthesteria is really kind of interesting genus because it's really variable in what it looks like as far as whether it just has ceridia on it or if it has apothecia and what the apothecia look like. And I did, there's one photo in Brodo that has, um, like, those little black star-shaped parts. That's part of the apothecia. And I hadn't seen a perticaria that had kind of like a little black star shape. There is a picture of a perticaria in, in Brodo's book um, from the East Coast, but, but it does show that funky shape. That looks like a What's the species name? Maybe it's on Sharnoff's website. It's Xanthodes. At the very least, it helps confirm that potentially the, the Perdisteria genus ID. Just being able to see something that looks quite similar. Yeah, it's really interesting just to flip through Perticeria in, in Brodo because the apothecia are really diverse. And, you know, some don't have apothecia. Like, we're really familiar with Perticeria. And then there's some that are like microfruticose. What does microfruticose mean? Looks like people. Oh, it looks kind of almost like a coral and fungus or something. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, it's a pretty weird genus. I'm I'm guessing that it's a uh, oh bingo. Oh, yeah, here's some pictures Sharnoffs of Perticeria that they don't quite have the cross, but they have that sort of weird inflated look with kind of buried apothecia. Yeah, and I've seen those like that one. Yeah. Uh, Perticeria californica is really common out on the coastal headlands, and I think um, some people call it potato lichen because you see those kind of balls with a bunch of little eyes, like the yeah. eyes of a potato. <laughs> and if you have the cow's calendar, you were looking at it all last month. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Other Perticeria. I think this genus is ripe for splitting. <laughs> Some ambitious young PhD candidate. Oh wow, this one's super different. Ah, there's the microfruticose. <laughs> yeah, isn't that cool? <laughs> yeah. I wonder how they figured out that that was a purchase area. I don't know. Isn't it all, doesn't it go back to the spores in the end? But I don't know that that one had apothecia. If it's not oh. fertile, yeah. Oh. If it's not fertile. Isn't there a song about sterile something lichens? <laughs> Can you sure. sing it for us? <laughs> I'm that one. Wow, what a weird genus. It's so diverse. Wow, look at that. Oh, that's funky. Yeah. yeah, that one looks messy. It's very globular. <laughs> uh -huh. so, so there's no Xanthodes in there, huh? I don't, I'm not but, seeing it in his, his list here. I haven't gotten through all of them. Yeah, this is alphabetical, though, so you've got a ways to go. There's, it's a very large genus. But those look Xanthodes. almost star-shaped. Here's there Xanthodes. There Xanthodes. Oh. Yeah, well, not star-shaped, but... Um, so certainly the genus encompasses a lot. <laughs> yeah, even the species seems pretty diverse. That's Xanthodes too? Wow. Oh, oh, yeah, that is quite diverse, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those first pictures looked a lot more similar to what we have. Right, this stuff. Hmm. No, but that's cool, whoever sent this one oh. in, that they're doing microscope work. That's really awesome. Kenichi, does uh, does Sharnoff have Perticeria postulata? 
Which is what the ID that the guy gave it was? He does not have Pustulata. Okay. Let's try yeah. Brodo. But I think if it's in Brodo, it's probably on Steve's website. Yeah. yeah, I was just looking through. It's not in Brodo. Okay. Pustulata? Oh, yeah, it's in a Sonoran key. Yeah, but that's not sure enough. What is a Veru K? It's uh, when you have a crustose lichen that's cracked into chunks. Those are, those are Verucos. Okay, so I'm just reading about Perdisaria pustulata, and it says fertile Veru K. Concolorous with thallus. Ampliate <laughs> or erect. <laughs> Amplier. <laughs> this is a difficult key to read. <laughs> I can say that. Uh, amp that word is a, it's a purchase area specific word. I could look it up in Dibbin's book for you because I don't keep those things in my head. Wait, third time's a charm. Ampliar it. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, you know, all, I, a lot of these terms are new to me, but yeah, when they're specific to uh, a genus, it's good to learn what those are so that you can work through these keys and not mm -hmm. be confused, not be too scared by them. <laughs> can I share my screen right now? Yeah, go for it. Uh, let me make sure I get the right. This is from the Tropical Webs Tropical Lichens website. Um, there you go. That's a little bit closer to the observation in iNaturalist, but not hmm. completely. Is it a tropical group? Mostly. Um, this doesn't have that information. The photograph is from Australia. Hmm. Yeah, that's a weird one. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna check the Dibbon book for Postulata. Sarah and Shelley, did you have any any observations in particular that you wanted to check out? I think we sort of have time for one more, and maybe we can talk about this one a bit more, and then we can call it a night. Yeah, I, I haven't actually looked through the list to see what's there. Um, but yeah, if you have one you want to pull up, we can look at something else. Let's see if I had any others that looked interesting to me. Here's one that I'm not sure can actually be identified. Um, we can get back to that, that other one, Tom, if you have any more input on it. But yeah, this is like another purchase area. Right. Uh, yeah. Oh, you think this is another purchase area? Yeah. Looks like it. Does it <laughs> kind of the ringed appearance? Irony. It definitely looks ringed. Yeah. It, can you taste it? Can you tell me if the radia are bitter? I'm licking my screen now. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you know, Tom really got me the first time. I did not know the species, and I he, did not. He did. He he got me hook, line, and sinker. He said, "This is sugar lichen. You have to taste it." And I did, and and I still didn't get it. I didn't get the joke. I was going, this is horribly bitter. It doesn't taste like sugar at all. And he's laughing. <laughs> <laughs>
I always tell people that it's a gag when I do that. After always, they do it. <laughs> always. <laughs> um, yes, black and electrical humor. That green anyway. color and the alternating white and green zonation bands on that. Um, uh -huh. I'm pretty sure that's purchase area Amara. Amara, okay. But where is this guy? He's in Sonoma County again. And if we could lick it, then it would be bitter. Yep. Okay. How did a screen taste, by the way? Could it <laughs> Not that bitter, actually. No, okay. <laughs> Neither was it sweet. Any dioxins in there? <laughs> <laughs> if I knew what those tasted like, maybe. <laughs> And my, my my screen basically just tastes like dust. <laughs> yeah. I get that. So Tom, you said the the concentric rings of the two different like contrasting colors, the green and the white. Well, I've seen purchase area Amara that does not look like this also. Right. But but I've also seen purchase area Amara that has this. I, I wouldn't take it as being diagnostic by any means. Um but you know, it, it looks like a really thin thallus, uh, and and it has those zone lines. And is there was there something else that you mentioned that was any it was a diagnostic feature or no? That was it. No, that was it. Okay. But but that's not a diagnostic feature. Okay. How about the bitter taste? Well, that's diagnostic. If we could lick it, we could definitely say what it was. If you could lick it, you would know whether it is or is not. Okay. <laughs> now we're just all going to be licking lichen. <laughs> <laughs> there, lichen. Do we know what it is that's bitter? What What's in it? That's not in another lichen? Um, yeah, I'm sure that it tells you in every lichen ID book. Maybe it's picrolichenic acid. I, I don't know. Then I don't know. Well, cool. That was weird that I picked another Pertus area completely at random. No, awesome. <laughs> Did you have any more you wanted to say about that other Pertus area, Tom? Um, well, this guy tends to be a really verbose Pertus area expert, so he does give diagnostic characters for Purchase Area Postulata, mm -hmm. but it's like a 12-line paragraph. <laughs> so I don't think it would be um, uh, helpful, <laughs> helpful to us, to tell you the truth. Gotcha. Alrighty. Um, did anyone have any, any other observations they wanted to talk about or any other announcements related to cows that you wanted to make? Well, we have um, rare lichens listed with the California Native Plant Society's rare plant inventory as of, um, I believe it was about a week ago. Oh, really? For the first so time they, ever. Did they release a new, did CNPS release an, a new list of, of rare plants? Uh, their list is, well, since things are online now, it, it undergoes revision on a probably fairly continual basis. Uh -huh. The big difference now is that their inventory of rare plants now includes rare lichens as well. Oh, cool. Um, this came about through a collaborative agreement between CNPS and the Lichen Society. And for people looking for information on rare lichens in California, those that actually have conservation status, they can now go to the CNPS inventory and query for lichens. Cool. It's totally cool. I'm so proud of CALS for that. Um, and a lot of this was supported by a grant from the Mead Foundation, which our president pursued and obtained, uh, because it takes money to do these things. Uh, but it's, it's a huge uh, uh, step forward for lichen conservation in California. Um, do they have the same rankings that all the other CNPS uh plants do? The rankings were adapted for lichens. Um, it, they, the 
California Lichen Society's Conservation Committee decided to rank lichens based on the Heritage Program, which is in California, CNDDB, as well as providing uh, CNPS equivalent ranks for their species. Cool. And are there any conservation implications for these listings? Absolutely, because now they fall under CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act. Oh, cool. so, so they now have conservation status. The the lists that had been publicized uh, prior to this, um, they were, uh, what was the word for the Magni and Brot list, uh, Shelley, do you remember? It was a preliminary list. Yeah, I don't know. And and they had no status at that time, but now they have, they have actual um, uh, legislation behind them. That's awesome. Yes, it is. It's amazing. <laughs> and we should be really proud of the Lichen Society. Absolutely. Yeah, the only one on this list that I'm seeing that I even recognize is Osnia Logissima. <laughs> there you go. Which we hear has a new name these days. Oh, the Dolicho Osnia? Yeah. You know, I looked up the paper on that because I ran across that, and the paper is like four years old, and... Uh, I don't know anybody who's using that name. Yeah, I I, I know. It's, it's kind of interesting that this came up because uh, Sarah and I first saw that name because of INAT, because like that's the name that it pulled in. Probably there was somebody looking at a lichen during the BioBlitz, and they saw that it was an Usni, but they didn't know that name for it, and so they knew it as Old Man Fear. And so they probably typed in Old Man's Beard, and what popped up was losing a long distance. Dolacho Usnia, huh? Yeah. That was our first indication that maybe there was this other name for it. Yeah, yeah it looks like it's Scott in, switched them out. Yeah, and it's not in the... Um, so Esslinger has this list that most lichenologists in the United States go by for the nomenclature, the North American checklist. It's not in there. And yeah, I wonder why it wasn't included because I'm sure there was there's been an update to that list since four years ago. Yeah, the list is about uh, two or three months old right now. It's quite current. I, I think that probably somebody published a paper but nobody's nobody's agreeing with them. That's what I think. Um, huh. Yeah, the list is from uh, the 23rd of March, 2014. Although now, now we're getting into somewhat into gossip, but we did talk with somebody who said that the person who published the original paper um, of the the, I think it was the genetic work that um, separated the species um, into the other genus, that the world expert on Usnia was was there during. The defense or presentation of that paper, and that they did not object to the the splitting out of Philippe and Luton. So, You're talking about Philippe Clerk. I, I'm not. I don't know. That, like I said, this is just gossip, and I don't have the details. But um, but it, yeah, it would be interesting to, to talk with some people that know more about what's going on with that name change and whether it's been actively. Um, Debunked, or this hasn't been accepted yet, or what? What the deal is? Well, for the time being, I'm sticking with what's in Esslinger because he has uh, been doing this for years, and and I appreciate the fact that I can go to one place to find out what the current names are. Yeah, and we talked about that too, um, about the fact that you know. Sometimes we do have that opportunity, like with publishing the list of rare lichens through CNPS in their rare inventory. We could ask them to change that name, but then there will be different names out there, and it will create more confusion. So if we're if it's something that needs to change, it's better that everybody accepts it and changes it at the same time, so that it doesn't create too much confusion. Yeah, the interesting thing for me was that uh, the paper splitting the genus, like I said, was several years old, 
and that seems like ample time for well for the NIN to show up in in other locations too but it has not I'm curious where does iNaturalist get the name from because wherever that is they've accepted it. <laughs> uh, so Scott is the one that committed the change so this is the taxonomic change history for Osnea lungissima and you can see that he swapped it into Delicho Osnea based on this paper by Christina Arcus at um, Uppsala University. I assume this is the paper that you were talking about, Tom, in Taxon. Yeah, that looks right. Um, and yeah, so <clears throat> generally we try to follow index fungorum for, for fungal stuff, but for whatever reason, Scott found this paper and decided it needed to be updated to Dolichoznia. Does Scott just the user? I, I user who found he is. He is just a user, but he's also, he's also the co-director of iNaturalist. <laughs> he's somehow more involved in iNaturalist than a normal user. Yeah, Scott's yeah. the Scott's the co-director. Scott and I are the co-directors of iNaturalist. So. All right. Yeah, because yeah. I, I don't think the the basic iNaturalist user is changing things names, but you never know. No, the only people can, who can change names on iNaturalist are the, like the site curators, and there are quite a few of them, but only a handful of them really do anything. Um, Scott is one of them. All right. So, so I'm noticing on this map there are the blue is Dolicho Usnia, and the I'm going to call it brown. You guys can disagree with me. Um, the brown is Usnia longissima. Um, so are there long, filamentous, pendulous lichens with fibrils? Uh, are there two of them now, or are they all, are all of the Usnea longissimas now Dolicho Usnea? Right now, they're, they've all been moved over to Dolicho Usnea. All so that's of what, them. Yeah, on iNaturalist, when you make a change like that, it, it changes all the affected observations if it's just a one-to-one -one change, unless the observers of those observations have opted out of the system. So you can change your settings and say, I don't want my names to change based on INAT's taxonomy. When I say it's this, I want to stay that. So in that case, you could have some dolicho usnea longissima observations and some usnea longissima observations. Yep. OK. But we, we try to track. The, each individual concept so that we know, like, you know, this observation is of this taxonomic concept and this one is of this other concept, but these concepts are related by this this change related to this paper. Yeah. I remember quite fondly the guy in Virginia who found a Sneolongissima in one of the parks out there. Huh. It's not just on the Pacific Coast? Um, it, true, it's not, but it's, it's also not in Virginia. Oh, interesting. He just thought he found it. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, like I was saying earlier, I think one of my interests in iNaturalist is putting on the brakes. Well, it was interesting with the um, with the BioBlitz how somebody did end up selecting uh, Dolicho usnea longissima as a species identification, and I think that was maybe just a mistake based on the common name of old man's beard. But um, from the photograph, it was a little too blurry to even tell whether it was an Usnea or possibly a Romulina. And so it, it ended up that we you know, moved that out of that uh, identification. But then, lo and behold, not too long afterward, Usnea longissimo was actually found during the BioBlitz in one of the trees that was. There it is. Climbing. So. Yeah, I think that's this top observation, although it has no photograph. Was the one from the canopy. The yeah. page, the page you had right before that, though, was the Marin, was the uh, Marin watershed district observation. There you go. Uh, yes, and it looks like you confirmed this one. Um, I did because of the stuff that's in the shadows. It's quite long, and uh, what did I write? Niggling detail. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep, about Delicho Isnia. Oh, okay. There we go. Anyway, interesting. So eyes out for, for Osnea longissima or Dolicho Osnea longissima, depending on which name you'd like. Yeah, we'll, see. we'll see how it all shakes out. If yeah. anybody's interested in kind of doing more, more looking for it, you could do that from the forest floor. You could be looking up into the canopy of some of the, the bigger, older trees out there to see if you see any of this long pendulous 
loosening up in, in the trees. Like in photography with a telephoto lens, huh? <laughs> you can look for well, birds and like it. <laughs> right, exactly. You can multitask. Well, okay, I think that's that's it for this evening. Um, I'm definitely done. Yeah. <laughs> cool. I, I've enjoyed this. Thank you again, Kate, yeah. for putting this together. No problem, and thanks for participating, you guys. It's always great to talk to you, and uh, hopefully we can do it again sometime this year. Let's not make this a yearly thing, at least, you know, twice a year. <laughs> yeah, or even better, let's, um, let's plan a field trip in May. Oh, that'd be super exciting. Yeah. All righty, guys. Thanks. Thanks, Frank. Good night. Good night. Good night, everybody. Peace.